Our second keynote for this summit is by uh, Farnam Jahanian, who is a president at CMU. Farnam and I go back many years when we both had more hair and we used to work for IBM Research, and which was at the time used to be really a fantastic research lab and was a source of many, many people that end up going to academia. Farnam has, has risen to the rank of uh, uh, University of Michigan, was assistant uh, director at uh, NSF for SAIS, and then went to CMU and went through a sequence of vice president for research, provost, and our president. So we bring rich background in, in their cell research, in, in government, in, in academia, and he's going to offer us his perspective. Please, Farnam. Thank you very much, Moshe, um, for the kind introduction. It's good to be with you this morning. And Jim and Moshe, thank you very much for, for the invitation. Um, delighted to be with you, to share with you some thoughts and engage in this conversation on, on an increasingly important topic, not just to US, but of course to, to the entire world. As all of you know, um, over the past decade or so, a few undeniable trends have emerged. And the first, of course, is the rapid, as we heard yesterday, rapid pace of technological advances today that's truly unprecedented. It's impacting every sector of our economy, the acceleration in scope, in the pace, and ubiquity of these advances are transforming just about every industry uh, one by one. And as you heard yesterday from, in Jeff Kloon's presentation and uh, Bart's uh, presentation, the future is very exciting. Uh, we also see a deeper integration of cyber and physical world. This is much more than just sensors being embedded and collecting data from sensors and so on. There is a, a true deep integration of intelligence automation, as you know, into almost everything physical. Uh, despite the rapid change, uh, there's also bold optimism that the impact of technology will be hugely positive and in this hyper-automated world that we live in, uh, uh, we will see a much safer world, more efficient, more innovative, and so on and so on. Of course, as every sector of economy is impacted, as you heard through a number of presentations yes yesterday, there are unanticipated societal consequences for us, from education to workforce to civil discourse to social justice, security, privacy, and so on. I'm going to try to focus much of my conversation on the topic of education, although, as Moshe mentioned yesterday, there are a number of significant policy considerations one has to consider. Um, you know, I don't want to repeat a lot of the data that you have seen uh, in, in recent months, but there's, if you listen carefully, some of the anxiety that we hear in the world about the future of work, all cultural, and some of the anxiety are, without any doubt, are economic in nature. The retreat of state investment, if you will, uh, has coincided with a transformation of, uh, that we're seeing in the nature of work. There are plenty of data to show the sources of anxiety. You know, for 30 to 45 percent of working age population around the world is underutilized. You heard about data that perhaps 50 percent of the world economy could be affected in the next few decades by the adoption of the technologies. We know that employers talk about um, the fact that they can't fill positions because of lack of skills, and the list goes on and on. And also, it is undeniable that much of the employment growth that we have seen, especially over the last decade, has been due to these alternative work, if you will, and partially to the gig economy. But I want to step back for a second. And when we talk about work, of course, there is an economic aspect of it, but it's a much deeper issue. Craving for dignity is universal. People like to feel valued. Work is not about just economic rewards. Work is about purpose, it's about self-respect. Work it provides a sense of self-worth. Idleness, as others have said, is a soul destroyer. And economic insecurity, of course, there's plenty of data to show that has causes profound worries and, of course, causes to all sorts of other types of illnesses in society. As it was mentioned already, while these concerns may be contemporary, the truth is that 
these are not new concerns. Of course, going back to the 18th century, we've seen this. This is a very, very old concern. In fact, in more recent decades, the concern around automation worried American leaders in the 1950s and 60s. Martin Luther King warned repeatedly of the challenges posed by automation. President Johnson, in fact, um, created a commission to study automation and to look seriously the at the possibility of the ways of the new technologies that were coming online and, and, uh, and the potential mass unemployment. Of course, when you look, if that's John Kennedy, I should say, that has a famous quote that says, if men have the talent to invent new machines that put men out of work, they have the talent to put those men back to work. So this is not new. Uh, in fact, if you look at just the most recent history of automation between the uh, you know, late 30s and, and uh, 2010, um, we have seen enormous, and just in, in terms of industrial automation, we've seen enormous advances. Assembly lines and offices have become far more automated, as you know, and in fact, the concerns that were uh, raised by many leaders in the 60s and the 50s and 70s, in fact, arrived. Uh, there was more or less as essentially arrived on schedule. In fact, when you look at unemployment, and Moshe yesterday talked about that, you have to be very suspicious of unemployment data because of the way it's counted, and he's absolutely right. But even if you take the data at face value, the truth is that the, that um, uh, the, the, the rise of automation actually in the wake of mass unemployment that was ex expected in the 50s and 60s, it actually did not happen. What we've really seen is putting aside depression and a great recession, the un un unemployment range, even by, by the accounts from the government, is about 5 to 10 percent and it fluctuates and so on. And we haven't seen really the massive kind of unemployment that Peter talked about. In fact, many of the stories about truckers and so on, yesterday, in fact, uh, uh, my colleague Mark Hamlet highlighted this, that the latest data from the American Trucking Association shows that there is roughly a shortage of 50,000 truck drivers, and by 2022, there are 100,000 truck driver shortages in this country, and you also heard stories about ATM uh, machines and, and tellers. In fact, banks have just as many vice president and tellers as they used to uh, decades ago. And by the way, they don't have anything else except vice presidents and tellers, as it turns out. Uh, but it's a little bit more nuanced than that. While the automation wave of the past century did not bring mass unemployment, it did bring an explosion of inequality. This graph really does show it's a breakdown of wages over time by educational level. It's undeniable that our most educated citizens have contributed to see, can continue to see their wages rise robustly over time since the 70s, but the less educated citizens have seen their real income uh, in fact fall uh, since the 70s. In fact, the past uh, half century of technology progress has had a pronounced skill bias, and uh, the data bears that. But the history and theory has told us, in fact, that rising inequality that's created by industrialization and technology would be followed by strong forces of equalization on society that becomes richer and people buy more stuff and so on and so on. But unfortunately, the inequality that we're talking about is very pervasive and the risk that we face is that it's gonna get worse. I'm not gonna elaborate on this slide. I'm just gonna tell you that there's a fabulous article in the latest issue of The Atlantic that talks about this inequality and the gap that's rising and the rise of what it refers to as a new aristocracy in the United States. I encourage you to look at this because it really talks about the role of automation and the changes that we have seen in the workforce and how the, the wealth essentially distribution in this country has become very, very skewed and highlights the equality, inequality issue that <clears throat> I was mentioned. So are we at an inflection point? And I'm gonna get to the education piece in a moment. Technological innovations have always disrupted the status quo and have underpinned economic, uh, dynamic economic change. But today's technological advances, if I can summarize something that was said yesterday, causing disruption across markets and industries, its ubiquitous adoption at a pace that we have not seen in the history of essentially humanity. And we're also seeing an acceleration of economic impact because digital in, uh, innovation is not just additive, its impact has been exponential in nature. And what that means, in fact, is that while in the previous 
uh, uh, time during, say, the second industrial revolution, maybe, maybe we've had 50 years, 75 years to deal with that. Today, we do not. And this is the pace and acceleration that causes a problem. So what does this mean for education? And what are some of the challenges in responding to this uh, tech-driven future? One one-line summary for you for, uh, that I want to share with you is that we cannot address the educational challenges that we have within just the context of the change in the workforce. I think we have to step back and look at the broader challenges that we face society when it comes to education. I want to highlight three of them and then talk about some solution spaces. First and foremost, and, and all the academics in this room and everyone who has a college age kit can attest to this, that one of the most fundamental challenges that we face in this country and potentially across the world is affordability and access to college education. And the data is undeniable. Since 1985, college tuition has risen by 500% compared to a consumer price index increase of 121%. We have a lot of explanation why that's the case, but the truth is that is the case. Aggregate student debt in this country has more than doubled since 2006. This is US data from 500 million to 1.2 trillion, and this year actually is 1.3 trillion dollars, and that's equivalent roughly to the size of the entire US junk bond market. Think about that for a second. And one more thing that happens, and by the way, this is not uniformly true of all academic institution, but this barbell shape of financial aid in this country is squeezing out the middle class because people in the higher socioeconomic tier can t send their kids to whatever college and university uh, they want to send them to. And the financial aid, in aggregate, I should say, it's not a specific about any institution, in aggregate is biased heavily toward the lower socioeconomic uh, tier, which one can have very good justification why you need to have that to, in to increase mobility and access in the country. What happens as a result of it is that the middle class in this country is getting squeezed out when it comes to access and education. The second issue related to access and reach has to do with the fact that meritocracy, it seems to be hereditary. It actually correlated to your zip code. It's correlated to your family income. And again, the data bears that out. A recent study that was published talks about that study of 38 colleges where they was based on millions of essentially anonymous tax record showed that colleges are even more economically segregated than previously understood. In fact, um, looking at the 38 elite colleges had more students from the top 1% of the socioeconomic tier than the bottom 60%. In fact, less than one half, half one, one percent of children from bottom fifth of the American families attend elite colleges. Now, let me talk about the second issue. So the first is that as access and equality. The second issue is that as technology plays a much bigger role in our world, the growth in STEM jobs has outpaced overall job growth. It's undeniable. And the parents are telling their kids, study engineering, study computer science. But let's look at this data. While we can talk about all STEM jobs, and I'm 100% on board going from STEM to STEAM. The truth is, if you look at the projection of day job over the next decade or so at least, based on the US Department of Labor Statistics, 75% of job growth is going to happen in areas of computing, information technology, and engineering. So we're going to have to essentially deal with that issue. And there are a number of recent studies, I'll refer to a couple of them in a moment, that and, and someone mentioned this yesterday, where the change essentially that we have seen, the growth that we have seen in the CS majors is undeniable. CS enrollment across all of our academic institutions, unless you artificially cap it, has skyrocketed over the last 10 years. Um, and, and of course, we have an acute shortage of computer science faculty. Um, so we can't be in denial, it's the fact and the university leadership and universities have to deal with this. And I understand, as a, as a university sitting university president and a former provost, how difficult it is to change resources to accommodate, essentially, the, is the significant growth that we've seen in student enrollment and the need. But another issue that I want to highlight has to do with adaptability. We can't predict what skills the kids are going to need, the students are going to need. Here's one data that is just very compelling. 
65% of jobs is expected that will be performed by Generation Z throughout their careers do not exist. And I talk about this all the time with parents of freshmen. When a freshman comes to Carnegie Mellon University this year, by the time they graduate, they're going to be in the workforce for the next 40, 50 plus years. And that's true of all of our essentially students who come to our institutions. The question is, they're gonna be in jobs that have not even been created. And the challenge is, what do we teach them? And of course, a number of comments have been made that in addition to technical skills, we need to teach them cognitive skills, of course, social skills, communication skills, collaboration skills, and so on and so on. So what do we need to do? I firmly believe we are at the cusp of the next transformation of higher education in this country, potentially across the entire world. And I wanna talk uh, in the next 10 minutes or so 10, 15 minutes about this transformation that I see coming. By the way, again, this is not a new concept. There have always been synergy between technological advances, demanding new skills and changes in the workforce, and breakthroughs that we have seen in higher education. In fact, at every stage of significant technological change that we have seen over the last century plus, the US and the rest of the world has advanced a major innovation or two in education. In fact, I just want to share with you a, a brief um, a, a history uh, lesson here. Look at higher education reform that happened, you know, after the Civil War, but really accelerated during the Second Industrial Revolution. Education reform mirrored, in fact, profound changes that we saw in society. Varying models of education were developed and entirely new institutions were formed. We sit here, of course, a century later and, and take for granted all of those changes that we have seen in education as if has come, has happened overnight. In fact, a century ago, going to college means you studied classical languages and it was for a very small elite part of the society. But change in the impact in the industrial revolution and the workforce led to many, many experimentation, formation of new universities like Cornell and Johns Hopkins and University of Chicago and so on, and a number of academic institutions like Harvard took lead. But just look, I, this is a, not a comprehensive list, but look at the list of things from Gem German style universities to land grant universities, which we talked about yesterday. Focus on applied science that happened earlier last century professional schools in law, medicine, and divinity, democratization of education that happened without any doubt, uh, inclusion of women, especially in, in, in earlier part of the century and then underrepresented group. The California master plan, which was masterful. And, and of course the Carnegie unit for standards in quality, all of that happened. This again took about 75 years plus actually closer to 100 years before it happened. But just between 1910 and 1980, I stopped at 1980, see the changes that we have seen. We have gone from 1,000 colleges and universities to 3,000, a million students enrolled to 12 million, 5% of college age population to 40%, 37,000 bachelor degrees to a million, and you know it's significantly more now, 30 years later, from 2,000 master degrees to 300,000 for 400 doctoral degrees to 30,000 and from zero associate degrees to 400,000, just in the period of that. But it took 75 years, tremendous amount of experimentation, prototyping, and potential assessment and consolidation. So I believe we're at the next transformation of higher education. Unfortunately, we don't have 75 years to work with. Of course, repeating a couple of things that I said, the fourth industrial revolution that we're experiencing right now, unprecedented pace that we're seeing, greater pressure, in fact, on higher education as the engine of progress in knowledge-based economy. More and more, uh, the rest of society and parents look to higher education to serve, and, and governments, to serve as the engine of economic growth. And of course, there's a, massive shift that's taken place from industrial model of classroom to an information-based economy that's based on learning outcomes. So, the next 10 minutes or so, I would just wanna throw a bunch of essentially ideas out. The truth is, I don't actually know what the answer to this puzzle is. We know there are a bunch of things we can experiment with, but I think the transformation that's required has to be far, far deeper, and it has to be far, far more, um, I should say, far-reaching. 
The solution space that I want to talk about has four uh, places. And some of it, I must admit, is tactical, and some of it is fairly strategic, and it requires a much, much more uh, deep thinking and, and strategic sort of investment. Uh, so the first one is about reimagining content and enhancing digital core competency and incorporating human skills. And some of these things we talked about, but I want to encourage you to take a look at especially a couple of recent reports that have come out. One from CRA and the other one from the National Academies. The National Academy one was co-chaired by uh, Jerry Cohen, uh, former president at Carnegie Mellon, and Susan Hambrush from Purdue University. It's a terrific report looking at the growth of computer science and undergraduate enrollment, plus similarly uh, compelling data and, and content in, in the CRA report. Um, I'm preaching to the choir, I get this, but especially for my colleagues who are outside computer science, uh, there are a number of essentially institutional response, suggested institutional responses that have appeared in, in the National Academy report from limiting participation to growing programs to leveraging resources to rethinking organizational structure for CS. I just wanna say they're out there and many academic institutions are beginning to implement this. But if we're serious about core competency. It's not about just training computer scientists. The truth is that the enrollment crisis partially exa is, is definitely exacerbated by everybody else who needs to have computing and data intensive essentially uh, knowledge. So limiting participation is a crazy idea, but we are forced to do it because of the resources. And I think unless there are more practical approaches to dealing with that, this crisis will not go away. For the rest of our friends in the room who are not involved in running the departments but are in a leadership position, I say that rethinking organizational structures for computer science is extremely important. A number of universities had taken a lead on this. As you know, Carnegie Mellon and Georgia Tech are two very notable examples of computing colleges. And the reason and the rationale for that is computing is so pervasive it, it's the underlying, essentially, fabric that connects all disciplines. It's just as relevant to social science as it is to humanities, to engineering, and other sciences. I strongly urge universities to think about new structures that allows computing to, and by computing, I mean computing and information sciences, the whole, whole um, um, sort of um, range of disciplines that are connected together as a fundamental knowledge that needs to be elevated on university campuses. Um, a lot's going on in K through 12, let me skip over that, but we also need to think about incorporating soft skills. A number of speakers eloquently talked about this, let me not um, elaborate on it, except to say that Jeff Colvin, a few years ago, this was about 2013 or 2014, took a, wrote a fabulous book that's called Humans Are Underrated, what high achievers know that brilliant machines never will. He does say that it is a mistake to predict skills that machines will never replicate. In fact, if you just look at the last 10 years, all the things that we thought it would take machines at least a few more decades for them to master and automate, the truth is that most of us, even in the business, have been surprised. So the question he's really asking is how will we, how will humans add value and how will essentially you enhance our cognitive and physical capabilities through essentially automation. But one thing that he uh, is, is very clear about is that our greatest advantages lie, and I quote, in our deepest, most essential human abilities from empathy to creativity, so social sensitivity, storytelling human, and so on and so on. And these are the skills that we need to continue to build on. There is something we're experimenting with at Carnegie Mellon that I just wanted to highlight, and this is not intended to be a presentation at CMU and what we're doing, but there's an idea that we're experimenting with that I wanted to share. And while I'm on that note, I do want to acknowledge Mark Camlet, who was the provost at Carnegie Mellon for 15 years prior to my arrival to Carnegie Mellon. I'm deeply grateful to him because many of the advances that we have seen, uh, and a couple of them I will talk about, happen under Mark Camlet's watch. Mark, thank you. Uh, um, back to uh, the, this notion of teaching core skills with sidecars. The idea is that we know that we need to teach um, 
these other skills, from communication skills to uh, other skills that are, you know, maybe mistakenly are called um, soft skills. We know we need to teach them. The question is, how do we teach them? And often what we do is we design a course and have the students take a course, and then you have a check mark and you say, we're done with this. And the truth is that that has limited value, it has limited, essentially, uh, impact. Uh, in fact, we've seen most colleges, including us for a long time, teach core skills like writing and even skills like statistical analysis by requiring a first year course and then leaving it alone. The idea behind, b b b about this uh, notion of instructional sidecars is that, this is just an example, let's suppose you're teaching a main course. What we do is we develop sidecar topics, if you will, such as executive summary writing, literature search, collaboration and teamwork, and deeply embed that into the content of the course. And you don't do it just once. You do it practically for the entire curriculum. And furthermore, this course isn't taught by a single instructor. The main topic may be taught by an instructor who is a subject expert matter, say on data analysis, but other topics are taught by experts who come in and teach only the sidecar portion of it. And this is something that we've been experimenting with, with some great success that we have seen. And of course, data plays a huge role. You, we use data to inform assessment and learning outcomes, and at the same time, we integrate data into the learning process itself. Just one idea there. The other idea here um, related to this first topic has to do with um, 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 the notion of majors and, and, and departments and colleges. And uh, we heard um, Jeff Solingo talk about this a little bit yesterday. I really do believe that we're beginning to see the end of disciplinary silos. And all the experimentation that's taken place in various campuses seems to suggest that maybe in fact our students are ahead of us when it comes to this. This is four examples from Carnegie Mellon that we have done just over the last three or four years. And the response from students have been just incredible. And each of these programs is either a minor or a degree program that cuts across at least three, sometimes four colleges. And it's a much, much, much deeper integrated example. Maybe during the q and I can elaborate on this particular example. For example, in ca case of um, computational neuroscience, Students come in, there are set of foundational courses. We don't have a neuroscience department as it turns out, but a student can essentially major in cognitive neuroscience, biological neuroscience, or computational neuroscience, which is taught by some of our computer science faculty. And as a result of it, this cohort of students can actually get degrees from three different colleges and different departments and so on. So let me now talk about the second area of solution space. We need to completely rethink potentially the existing structure and transactional nature of education. Education has to be seen um, more as an activation, not a transaction. Today, students come in, particularly in four-year colleges, they spend four or five years with us, we give them a degree, and they leave. A number of people said this yesterday, that learning should be see viewed as a lifelong endeavor. It's an an all-in proposition, which means potentially different structure for our colleges and universities. Happy to elaborate on it at a later point. Uh, we need to think about the concept of four-year degree. Privatization of higher education and skill-based learning is happening. The higher ed in, in the nonprofit sector has to essentially deal with that. Uh, focus on outcome to drive incentives and create standards. And the proliferation of research universities across, especially in the United States, has had an unintended consequence. And this may come across as elitist, actually it is not, it's the opposite. What we've talked ourselves into in this country is that every university should get into a research business. That's actually been a mistake. We've had some great institutions that were amazing as teaching institutions, academic institutions whose core mission was to teach students. And many of them have talked themselves into believing that they have to become research universities. With increasing pressure on research funding from federal government and so on, this has led to 
a business model that's broken, it's not sustainable. And of course, there were discussions around teaching colleges and of course, professional teaching track, which by the way, CMU has, which I am a huge, huge fan of. So my view is that the disciplinary silos that I talked about are becoming obsolete. And of course, technology is gonna be a game changer. A couple of more words around that. Um, there were discussions around vocational training and learning art by doing. I completely buy into this notion. I just don't know that four-year colleges can completely avoid this and say, this is all up to community colleges. And there are some community colleges do a fabulous job of it and some that don't. But I don't think four-year four universities or academic institutions, including the research universities, can avoid that. The third area of solution space has to do with technology enhanced learning and investing in technology to, uh, to enhance learning outcomes. Okay, as a computer scientist, let me just make a confession. Every about 10, 15 years, we come up with a new technology as a community and we believe that's gonna transform education. 30 years ago, we said put laptops in every classroom, our education problems K through 12 will be solved. Actually, it has not. But the latest series of things, having to do with technology enhanced learning and MOOCs and so on. The motivation is great. Desire for personalization, desire for better learning outcomes, desire for controlling costs and increasing access. We have to be honest about it that many of the things that we thought were gonna come to fruition as a reasonable cost and scalable have not happened. My hope is that we will make a massive investment in understanding learning and the learning science and focus on um, technology enhanced learning as an intellectual endeavor which is then supported with experimentation and, 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 and additional work before we jump on the bandwagon of startups and trying to commercialize it and, and just make money off of this because I do not believe that that is, um, has, has been a fruitful uh, path in the past. The grand challenge to me is to have each student, to have a dedicated teacher delivering personalized learning at a marginal cost. And of course, that dedicated teacher is a person and potentially a person and a technology working together. So that's the grand challenge for us. I want to, before I finish up with my last um, solution space, is I want to quote Herb Simon, uh, who was very articulate and he was behind much of the science, learning science at CMU who said improvement in post-secondary education will require converting uh, teaching from a solo sport to a community-based research activity. And this is what I mean by we need to think about massive investment in research in this area and potential experimentation. The last solution space, and this is the very last one, is the changing role of private sector and the urgency for government policies. A number of ideas, very creative ideas, were highlighted yesterday at this uh, uh, summit and I don't wanna repeat them, but I wanna just highlight a couple of very quick points. One is we need as a society to rethink human capital development as a long-term investment. Our tax policies have to support it. Government policies have to support it. The private sector needs to also embrace this. And I think we're at a particular moment in history where that is feasible. An example of that is that you get tax incentive and there are favorable fiscal policies for investing in capital. However, those are not available to companies who wanna invest in human capital. And I think at least one speaker mentioned this, I think it was Moshe who mentioned this yesterday. This is a very, very compelling argument for us to think about human capital investment as a long-term proposition. It also means bridging the skill gap through technology enhanced learning it means rethinking income, of course, and rethinking safety nets as workers evolve and bringing employers much deeper into uh, vocational training. One idea that I am um, very supportive of, particularly if we go back and you agree with the premise that the middle class in this country is getting squeezed out and affordability and access is a crisis for education, at least in this country, is the notion of a national um, service cannot be underestimated. We've experimented with this going back to Civilian Construction Corps, Peace Corps, AmeriCorps, of course, Jobs uh, Corps in, in the last century. Uh, this would be an initiative that would provide training and essential skills for those who are not headed for college 
and also provide financial support for individuals who are going to go to college and then their college debt or portion of the college debt will be forgiven by the government. It's a loan essentially and it's forgiven by having a person go serve the country and serve the country in things that advance our societal needs and advance our, uh, um, the humanities uh, um, uh, needs over time. I'm going to leave you with one slide and quoting Horace Mann, who was a pioneer in education a couple of centuries ago, and he said, education beyond all device, other devices of human origin is the great equalizer and the balance wheel of social machinery. We need to take that advice to heart. Thank you very much. Two microphones. Two mics. Fantastic. Yeah. So when you look at the, how fast the world is changing on one hand, and you look at the terrain of higher education, are we making progress? Are we going forward? Are we falling behind? You know, I think we're making a lot of progress. Um, I'm an eternal optimist. I think as university president, you need to be an eternal optimist. Uh, um, I think we're making tremendous progress. But I think the pace and of the progress is not matching the pace that we see in terms of, is this on? No. We do have two microphones, except not one of them doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. okay. Here we yeah. go. Is this better? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So as I was main mentioning, is I think we're seeing significant advances, and I think the education community is absolutely committed to this, but I don't think the pace of advances is matching uh, the, the pace of uh, technological advances that we're seeing and the disruption that we're seeing and positive disruption as well in many sectors of our economy. Um, and, and I think one thing that's absolutely lacking is more experimentation. At the time that I know the cost of education is going up and universities are trying to figure out how do we essentially manage cost and when I talk to policymakers, especially in DC, I assure them that all universities are worried about the cost of education and, and they're doing many things trying to essentially manage cost, control the cost and, and uh, lower the uh, increases we see in, in tuition. But at the same time, there is absolutely a, a need for us to do more experimentation, play with different kind of models, different stru um, um, structures, different pedagogy, and be able to assess that and then be able to go back years later and potentially through consolidation and standardization and, and rethinking, uh, um, scale it to a larger fraction of our society. So we have some work to do on that front. What about CMU? What is CMU, CMU going? I mean, yeah. you gave us a very broad map for higher education. What is CMU doing? We're doing a bunch of things. I mentioned the notion of um, um, sidecars, which is something with our College of Social Science and Humanities has been experimenting with. Um, over the past five or six years, and Mark Camlet can correct me on this, our Mellon College of Science completely revamped its general ed education, completely changed it, and introduced many of the skills we're talking about from collaboration and teamwork and communication and so on have been deeply integrated into the um, curriculum for our science college. And preliminary evidence, even after a couple of years of it, is it has improved our retention significantly. And we're getting feedback from, from even employers that they like what they see. Uh, one of the other things that we have experimented with, and I had a slide that talked about, um, you know, provocatively trying to say the end of disciplinary silos. We launched something called ID8 which was a minor and a concentration, not a major on our campus. And the idea was to look at this nexus of art, media, technology, and design. And it far exceeded our expectation about how students responded to it. We have, and this by the way, this minor is, is not owned by a single department or college. Four colleges are involved. At least a dozen departments are involved. About 70 faculty are involved in teaching those courses. It's a pretty significant scale. 
And today, three years later, we have about eight or 900 students out of 7,000 undergraduates who are taking courses in our IDA program. And um, that's another example of some of the things we're doing. I think research universities, and someone mentioned, I think it was John Mitchell who mentioned this yesterday. We are used to the <coughs> idea of being interdisciplinary. And candidly, I say this with a great deal of pride, not taking credit for it, that this is so much part of the DNA of Carnegie Mellon. When it comes to graduate education and it comes to research, it is seamless. It's so interdisciplinary, it's hard to talk to a faculty and figure out what I'm talking to a computational biologist, somebody in engineering college or social sciences at times. However, that has not come down to undergraduate level to our satisfaction, and much of what we're doing is in that area. We're doing quite a bit, of course, in financial aid, dealing with financial aid uh, crisis that, that I think most universities are um, addressing, so, and more to be said. Can I ask you a question? Before that, I want to ask you one more question, then I'm happy to take okay. the question myself. I want to follow up on two points that you made. One sure. is the, the new aristocracy, mm -hmm. and the second one is the, the point of service, AmeriCorps and Peace yep. Corps and, and, yeah. and the like. So, especially elite universities such as CMU and Andreis, the way we describe ourselves is we are educating the leaders of tomorrow. Yes. But I look at what we are doing, and we are basically telling them, you're brilliant, we are going to educate you and launch you. We are not giving them any sense that they have any kind of a duty to society other than for the success of their own career, and hopefully they'll give us back a good, they will be very generous with us over their career. But I don't see that we're educating them as, you're very fortunate to be here, and with great privilege come great responsibility, you have resp responsibility for the people who are less fortunate. I don't think we're doing a good job at it. Are you guys doing a better job than we are doing? Um, well, that's a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> I hope so, but I think it's, what you're getting at actually resonates with me. Um, Parents are paying significant t tuition to send their kids to college. Um, and increasingly, our students and their parents are worried about jobs the students get after finishing. It's a reality of the world that we live in. So students try to hurry up and get through the program. One of the things, and I'll just quickly say what we're doing at CMU. When I started serving at Provost, we created something called the CMU Experience. And my comment was, and this is partially echoes what you said, my comment was, I know we give them a great education in terms of the skills that they need, whether it's an English student, a student majoring in English or computer science or mechanical engineering. I know we give them a great education. But my uh, um, sort of challenge to our faculty and, and our staff was, but are we developing the whole person? And we started essentially developing, and this is under the umbrella of CMU experience, it's on our website. We create a, a group of our faculty and staff and alum, and some of our most accomplished scholars actually came on board immediately. Because our goal was to dismiss any notion that we're trying to ease up on education and make it be easier to go to CMU. The focus was really develop the whole person. We've developed a number of tactical, some longer term strategic things that really get to the heart of developing the entire whole person because this person who leaves the education community become a citizen and a neighbor and a parent and so on. We have responsibility to do that. So are we doing a good enough job? Probably not, but I think many of us, including you, are worried about this. Now I'm happy to take your question. So, uh, you know, you are one of our most accomplished colleagues in the computer science community, member of several national academies, and you and I have known each other for many, many years, and, and fabulous research you have done in students that you have produced and so on. Over the past four or five years at least, this has become your passion. You essentially put most of your research on hold, um, jumping into this and spending, I don't remember how many miles you traveled last year, you told me this a few weeks ago. So my question for you is, why are you doing it? And I think I know the answer to it. And are we making enough progress as a community? So, you know, I think this uh, was great, I think maybe the, the, what is the Batman line, but I'm not sure where it goes, but with great power great, uh, comes great uh, responsibility. 
I don't think, especially a place like Rice and CMU, I don't think people on the daily basis, they complain about this, they complain about that. I don't think people realize how privileged we are. And, and I think this aristocracy thing really resonates with me. It's not that, that in academia we are really very rich, but we are doing so much better than, than a huge portion of the, of the population. And it just has to come up with some responsibility. And we have developed this technology. We cannot say, well, somebody else should worry about it. To me, this is just morally unacceptable. Are we making progress? Uh, yes. So I started talking about it in, in 2012. Um, I was greatly influenced by Watson. I mean, Jeopardy to me was kind of a milestone. Wow, this is, I took it much more seriously than what happened with chess. Chess somehow we all understood, just a matter of brute force computation. But, but Watson was a, I think was a watershed event. Uh, racing against the machine, the book came out and I started thinking about it. When I started giving talks about the, the, the impact of technology on jobs, the first reaction, well, you're just a Luddite, this all has been discounted many years ago, this is total nonsense. Or, even more shocking, really, I'm, this is serious, some people told me, don't give these talks, it's going to be bad for funding. Okay, which I thought is just as morally obtuse to say something like that, right, as if our funding is the most important thing in the world. But, and again, at the beginning was 2012, this was definitely a minority opinion. And, and you know, I'm several people, I'm not the only one, but a lot of people gave enough. This gradually moved more and more to the center. And, uh, you know, I mean, Scott has been one of the people has been talking about this, uh, you know, particular angle of universal basic income, but more and more people are, are, have been talking about it. And now it does not seem a, a, a niche opinion anymore. Now many people look, I mean, people are here. You're all here because you're concerned about it. And we are starting to move from, wow, this is happening to what are we going to do about it? You know, there is this line from a poem, if you want to change the world, look at the mirror and change the person in the mirror. And to me, this, is, this, this uh, meeting is partly about is, well, we have little inf influence on, on trade policy and on tax policy, but higher education, that's the person in the mirror. That's what we are going to do about it. So to me, yeah, I mean, it's maybe slower than I'm, I'm Israelis are never famous for their patience. Patience is not our national virtue. But it's moving, and to me, this, this meeting actually is a sign that this is moving. So I'm, yes, I'm always not happy with how much we've accomplished, but if I actually look at it realistically, yes, we have moved from a niche to the mainstream, and that's a big, that's big step. Well, for my part, I'm glad you took this up. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And thank you. And now we are, we are going to still have about uh, 10 minutes for other questions. Hi, I'm Chris De La Roca from Boston University. Uh, you made a very bold statement in one of your slides when you said that the proliferation of research universities is undermining higher education. Uh, you are the president of one of the preeminent research universities in the world. How do you plan to implement this statement in your own university as president? I, I wasn't talking about CMU, of course, but... <laughs> but, but, yeah, there's... I, you know, and I, you know, when I was at the National Science Foundation, I, I thought about the same issue, but because of the position that I was serving, I was very, very careful. In confidence, I would talk to some of my colleagues and friends, but it really gave me a visibility into the research enterprise of this country uh, from a perspective of not only the federal government, but also the uh, private sector. As you probably know, we did a number of, actually, activities. We did a number of, essentially, projects uh, at NSF, bringing industry to co-fund research with us. That, that view partially was shaped during my experience at NSF. And I wasn't at all suggesting that, oh, re no university should get involved in research. Far from it. We have amazing research universities in this country. And of course, they should continue to endeavor thereon. What has happened, however, is a number of, and I know this is a very controversial thing, is that a large fraction of our academic institutions who were doing an amazing job of education decided that, in fact, the way they're going to survive is by getting into the research business. And it's not at all clear 
that getting into the research business and the business model associated with it has made these academic institutions healthier. So it really does require us to think about it. Look, we run a, 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 a kind of institution that we know even the tuition that we bring in because of the financial aid we give is not enough to cover the cost of education. We know this, and we know that for um, public institution in this country, the contribution from state government and the legislatures to um, our um, public institutions has been going down steadily for a good 20 some years and it has had a dramatic impact on it. I spent most of my career, as Moshe mentioned, at the University of Michigan, uh, flagship higher education. I loved my experience at Michigan, but there's no question that 20 some years ago, Michigan decided that in fact, it, it relies still on, of course, funding from um, uh, um, uh, uh, state government, but every state in the Midwest has been hit with that. Um, so with the decline in the funding for education and then the continued pressure from the uh, funding from federal budget on, on R and for R&D, this has become unsustainable. So we need to think about being much more focused and targeted and not everybody do everything. And that's really has been a challenge for us. That's really what I was getting at. And, and I don't have a solution for it, to be candid, but we know that, uh, in fact, many of our research institutions who are here can attest to this, is that the overhead that we're collecting for research is also not paying for all the overhead associated with running our research enterprises. So we have a, a kind of a, a enterprise that the tuition doesn't cover it and the overhead from research doesn't cover it. So something has to give. Carolyn Lavander from Rice University. Yes. Um, thank you so much for that talk. And I wonder, you know, you've shared some terrific things that are happening at CMU. And yesterday we heard about real innovations at Georgia Tech and Maryland. And um, I wonder, though, given the scale of the challenge that uh, we seem to be confronting as an industry, to what extent do you think that individual institutions can come up with sufficiently robust answers from the inside? In other words, how much is this uh, a problem that might require a kind of larger uh, response? That's a terrific question, and, and it's a very insightful question. I appreciate it. I, I think um, the, the, the um, um, issue you raise is, a, is extremely important. Um, this is not a, a challenge that a single university can solve uh, on its by itself. I think when I said it requires experimentation, on one hand, I would like to see a lot more experimentation. Zibi's work at Georgia Tech has been um, extraordinary and, 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 and the impact is obvious. And you're right, Maryland is doing a lot. Many academic institutions, I know Stanford is doing, Rice, of course, is doing it. Um, I think you're absolutely right that we need to think about this holistically. We need to think about it, coordinated efforts by universities, collection of universities, and actually that did happen in a previous century when we saw some of the advances uh, that were implemented uh, in, in academic institutions. So I don't think we should do it alone. I think we should team up, and I think there'll be more resources as a result of that. Hi, um, Justin Piccarelli, University of Wyoming. So I'm kind of interested in um, this talk about the end of disciplinary silos. Mm. And I'm wondering what you do with the aspects of each field that are fundamentally incompatible with one another. Mm. What does that look like? And I think it might lead to epistemic pluralism mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, how does this affect the values we bring to the students in the classroom? That's a great it's, it's an important point you're raising. Um, and obviously, I was trying to be provocative by saying the end of disciplinary silos. I, I think probably one has to look at it as the silos that are, have been created through the notion of departments and colleges as a way of managing resources of the university and managing the complexity of an academic institution is probably outdated. I'm not at all suggesting that we shouldn't be training chemists or mechanical engineers or humans. Of course we should. Uh, but I think there are artificial structures that we have imposed on our academic institutions that have created silos. And I said, I say this with a great deal of pride, 
that when I came to CMU, it far expect, exceeded my expectation in terms of how fluid interaction of faculty across departments are. And if there's one contribution that I've made is that I changed the budget model of the university to actually even facilitate that more. So I'm not at all suggesting that disciplinary expertise are outdated. In fact, we do need to train chemists and biologists, but need to train more than that. And we need to create structures that facilitate that kind of collaboration and coordination, not only at the research level, but also at the undergraduate level, which is desperately needed. So, so that's uh, more than the, a comment and a question. And it, it's a discussion we had at the breakfast. So somebody at the table said, that actually universities don't understand the economics of a university. What some extra students, undergraduate, master, PhD, extra research, everybody makes all sorts of claims. We lose money on research. We lose money on students, you know. So how do we survive? It's absolutely not true. Who subsidizes what? Whom? Intuitively, I believe that our undergraduate subsidize research, and it's wrong. But is it true? I don't know. Similarly, I made the question larger. We don't understand the economics of higher education, producing all these PhDs. And actually, you alluded to something that also I intu intuitively believe that the production is too much, way, way, way too much. Way too costly and way too much. What will we do? So, Farnam, now you are in a position <laughs> to influence your colleagues uh, to create such studies per, per university and per the, for the system. Because we have data, but we don't really understand it. Sorry. Yeah. It's not a question. Fully agree. No, it's a question. What should we do? <laughs> Thanks for helping, uh, Moshe. I, I think it's actually, you're, you're absolutely right. And I do not at all want to suggest because I actually um, spent, as I said, my career at the university, at the University of Michigan, which honestly, it is fabulously run. And the way it handled its budget um, throughout the two decades that I was there and the discipline that the university brought to bear, as you know, Martha Pollack, who's another one of our colleagues and who was a provost, Phil Handlin was provost at Michigan and so on. The budget sits with the provost. Um, um, Phil, of course, is at Dartmouth and Martha is president at Cornell. I think we have a number of leaders across this country who completely agree with your thesis that we need to understand the business of the university, the economics of the university, and put incentives in the right place and disincentives also for managing essentially the, the business of the university. But one of the fundamental challenges, of course, we have in universities is that the evolution and the changes that we see in the structure and even the finances take time because of legacies that we deal with. And I know people in the private sector look at this and they don't understand it, uh, but I think your comment about we look at this individually and co collectively spot on, and potentially national academies could do a study related to this topic. Last question. Thank you. Thank you for the very fascinating talk. Um, <clears throat> so I, I've observed as being a professor that I think it's a bit um, crazy that we ask people to be at the cutting edge of research and throw their lives in every spare moment at becoming an expert in a particular field and then turn around and teach, say, the introductory material to that field. Uh, the reason I think that we want research universities and research professors to be teaching graduate students and undergrads is because they know the cutting edge and they know the most recent advances and so they can teach the upper division classes. But there's a trade-off there because if you spend all of your time focusing on a particular discipline, you're not spending time ramping up on, say, pedagogical expertise and the research on how to be an amazing teacher and developing the best course materials and staying on that area of, of uh, research. And so I love this notion that you suggested here that we might separate out professional teachers that become experts at teaching, say, the introductory materials that don't change that frequently, and then that other research-oriented research, research -oriented professionals maybe teach the upper division classes. And so I wanted to just ask you if you could flesh out a little bit more of your proposal and how it works and the economics of it, because now you have people that aren't bringing in grants, and I'm sure that that's an issue for the head office. Um, I, you drew a conclusion from what I said that I did not intend. 
Uh, let me explain. In my career, both in, um, at Michigan and at Carnegie Mellon, some of the best teachers that I have seen are also the most accomplished researchers. I've seen this over and over and over. In fact, when I was department head and later in life and, and, and so on, I've been adamant about the notion that our best teachers, our best researchers, should view part of the responsibility to teach freshman class. I think I have seen some amazing researchers who are incredible. Now, how do we build on that? What I was getting at is actually CMU has had a very successful teaching track, uh, um, essentially, uh, class of faculty. And Mark actually was partially responsible. I think Mark was responsible for creating that. So it's a real track where faculty members are evaluated. They go from assistant to associate to full teaching track. In fact, during promotion and tenure process that I run this university one, we review all of our teaching track faculty in the same way that we te review. There's a whole case book that's created for them and so on. It's rigorous, it's done at the department level, it's done at the college level, and it's done at the university level. So what I was endorsing is that if, we're gonna, if we are actually, the data shows we're hiring more teachers, let's not just hire them and call them adjuncts and instructors and so on. Let's take that as real part of our uh, academic community and build on it and compensate them appropriately and I think we'll have a healthier organization. That doesn't mean that people who are on the research side don't get to teach or just teach graduate classes. Uh, I think that's a much more nuanced assessment. The final point related to that I want to make is that I mentioned science of learning and I mentioned in, in, the continuing need for doing research on how people learn. The, 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 you know, the whole issue of cognition and so on. There's a lot of work to be done. And at CMU, we have taken some of that research and connected it with practice. So we actually have a center called the Everly Center that provides, and many universities do this, I know, but we've tried to bring some of our own research to bear to support our faculty members. And hundreds of faculty members at CMU actually take advantage of that. That's sort of, it's like, drinking your own champagne or eating your dog food, depending on day of the week. But uh, that's a somewhat long-winded response to your question. Thank you very much. <laughs>